Welcome to another deep dive. Uh, this time we're going to be tackling David Brooks's take on a pretty huge question. Okay. How can America rebuild itself for the future? And not just economically, but socially too. Right. He's arguing for something that sounds kind of radical these days. Yeah. A return to industrial policy in the U.S. Interesting. But this isn't about bringing back steel mills or anything like that. You're right. Brooks is arguing for an approach that goes way beyond those traditional ideas about education being like the sole engine of opportunity. Right. He's witnessed this growing divide in America firsthand, and it's not just about political differences. Yeah, he paints a very vivid picture of those struggling towns. Yeah. Many former manufacturing hubs that have been hit hard by the shift to an information-based economy. Right. You can almost feel the sense of being left behind that he describes. Yeah, and what's fascinating is that Brooks connects this to a potential blind spot in how we've approached policy for decades. Yep. This idea that if we just invest in education, the rest will fall into place. He even admits that he used to believe this wholeheartedly. Yeah, he points to presidents from both sides of the aisle, Bush, Clinton, Obama, all pushing for education reform. Mm -hmm. But then he makes this bold statement. What's that? He's not sure it's been enough because we essentially told people in these declining areas to go get educated for service sector jobs. Right. But we didn't ensure that those pathways were accessible or even sufficient. Yeah. And that's where his argument for a new era of industrial policy comes in. Right. And he sees the Biden administration as a prime example of this shift in thinking. It's really interesting because he doesn't just label Biden as pro-industrial policy. Yeah. He digs deeper. Yeah. He points to Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, who gave this speech outlining this new direction, okay. connecting it to national security concerns, particularly with the rise of China. It's a fascinating argument because it goes beyond pure economics. Right. Sullivan is suggesting we can't just focus on efficiency anymore. We need to think about resilience and strategically investing in key sectors, mm. almost like we did during the Cold War. Right. Which leads to the big question, mm. what exactly is industrial policy? Right. I mean, we've heard whispers of it before, Right. but Brooks seems to be saying something much bigger is happening here. He's talking about a more active role for the government in shaping the economy. Not just setting the stage. Okay. Think large scale investments in infrastructure, targeted support for specific industries, particularly in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It's a move away from the, the free market will solve everything approach that's been dominant for decades. So we're talking about a potential seismic shift in how we think about the role of government in the American economy. Potentially, yeah. It makes you wonder though, if this is such a great idea, why haven't we done it already? Well, Brooks acknowledges that industrial policy has a pretty mixed track record. Great. He points to attempts to industrialize Africa in the 20th century, which largely didn't pan out as intended. Right. And even some less successful U.S. industrial policies from the 1970s to the 2000s. So it's not a guaranteed recipe for success. Yeah. What went wrong in those past attempts? Often the policies were poorly designed with investments made without much regard for efficiency or long-term sustainability. Okay. Brooks highlights the risk of government overreach. Too much intervention can stifle innovation and create bureaucratic nightmares. Okay, so there's a need to strike a delicate balance. Right. But what about the success stories? Right. Are there any historical examples of industrial policy working well? Brooks mentions Japan as a supposed early model of industrial policy success. Okay. However, he quickly points out that the Japanese economy has stagnated in recent decades. Right. While the U.S. economy, despite all its flaws, has continued to grow, yeah. so it's not a surefire solution for long-term prosperity. And of course, we can't forget about China. Right? They've implemented industrial policy on a massive scale recently, haven't they? Absolutely. China is the elephant in the room when discussing industrial policy today. Right. And Brooks acknowledges that their rapid economic growth over the past few decades seem to suggest that massive government intervention could in fact work. But he doesn't seem entirely convinced, does he? Exactly. He points out that China's growth was actually fastest when they were liberalizing their economy. Interesting. Not after they began implementing more aggressive industrial policies. He highlights some warning signs. Slowing growth stalled productivity, declining public morale. Okay. So the jury's still out on whether China's approach is sustainable in the long run. 
So there are potential downsides to industrial policy, both historically and in the present day. Yeah. Brooks doesn't shy away from that. What specific concerns does he raise about this new industrialism? One concern is that industrial policy could escalate global tensions. Right. When you start picking winners and losers in the global economy, you inevitably create friction with other countries, even allies. Right. He mentions the rise in protectionist measures worldwide and the potential for trade wars, which ultimately hurt everyone. So it's not just about domestic economics. It has major implications for geopolitics as well. What are some other concerns? Brooks also worries about excessive regulation. He argues that industrial policy often leads to more regulations as the government attaches strings to its investments, you know, right. aiming for various social goals. This is where he channels a bit of classic Reaganism, arguing that too much regulation can stifle the very growth and innovation we need. He uses the example of the European tech sector, which he sees as lagging behind the U.S., partly due to what he calls inconsistent and restrictive regulation. Yay. So it's a delicate balancing act, trying to support industries without smothering them. Precisely. But despite these concerns, Brooks also sees some encouraging signs, particularly with the Biden administration's industrial policies. Okay, let's talk about that. What's giving him a glimmer of hope? He points to the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHPS and Science Act. Okay. These allocated billions to bolster American industry. And we've already seen a surge in private investment, especially in semiconductor manufacturing and clean energy. So the private sector is actually biting. Are we seeing real world results? It seems so. Brooks mentions seeing significant increases in factory construction, especially in the industrial Midwest, which have been hit hard by the decline of manufacturing. Right. He even talks about sensing a renewed sense of optimism in those areas. That's heartening to hear. It sounds like these policies could have a real human impact beyond just the economic numbers. Yeah. But earlier, we talked about the need for social revitalization, not just economic. Right. How does Bruce address that alongside industrial policy? That's where his recommendations for a modern approach get really interesting. He argues that simply reviving these industries isn't enough. We need to think about the social fabric of these communities. So he's coming back to that stark divide he described at the beginning, right? Yes. And he argues that we need a more holistic approach. That's where he brings in the concept of social capital. He cites economist Raj Chetty, whose work shows that factors like strong families, intact communities, even cross-class friendships can significantly impact upward mobility. So it's about more than just jobs and economic opportunity. It's about rebuilding the fabric of these communities, strengthening those social connections that help people thrive. Exactly. Brooks argues for place-based programs that recognize the neighborhood, not just the individual, as the unit of change. Okay. It's about weaving together economic policy, family policy, and community revitalization into a cohesive strategy. This feels much more hopeful than simply telling people in struggling communities to learn to code which seems almost insensitive given the challenges they face. It's about understanding that economic opportunity without social support is often not enough for people to truly succeed and thrive. But of course, there's another layer to this whole conversation that we can't ignore. You're talking about China, right? Mm -hmm. Even if we get all this right, what about their growing influence on the global stage? Exactly. Brooks doesn't shy away from that challenge. He dedicates a whole section of his argument to addressing China. So how does he suggest we navigate this new era of global competition with China, especially if we're shifting towards a more active government role in the economy? That's where BRICS lays out five specific principles for a modern industrial policy. Okay. A framework for approaching not just economic revitalization, but also this geopolitical balancing act. His first principle is to focus on what he calls pleasant surprises. Pleasant surprises. Okay, I love that phrase. What does he mean by that? He argues that the government shouldn't try to micromanage the economy, picking winners and losers. Okay. Instead, we should focus on funding basic research and development, setting the stage for innovation, and letting the private sector run with those discoveries. So instead of trying to predict which specific industry will be the next big thing, we invest in the building blocks of innovation, which could lead to breakthroughs we haven't even imagined. Exactly. Brooks uses the example of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Right. They funded all sorts of seemingly out there research, and one of those pleasant surprises was the internet. Talk about a return on investment. That single innovation has radically transformed our world. Right, so Brooks proposes creating something like a DARPA for manufacturing, focusing on breakthroughs in material sciences, tool making, efficient production processes, figuring out how to build things better. That makes a lot of sense. Invest in the foundation and let American ingenuity take it from there. 
but that also sounds expensive and potentially a bit removed from the immediate needs of those struggling communities we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. How does Brooks address that? That's where a second principle comes in, picking the low-hanging fruit. Okay. Alongside those long-term investments in research, he argues we should focus on obvious areas of scarcity where there's broad agreement on the need for action. Give me an example. What kind of low-hanging fruit are we talking about here? He lists a few. Housing transportation, clean energy, healthcare research, and shipbuilding. These are areas where there's a clear need for more investment, innovation, and capacity. So by focusing on these shared needs, Brooks suggests we can avoid those ideological battles that often stall progress and actually get things done. It's a pragmatic approach, but it still feels very economics focused. Mm. Does he address the social and cultural aspects alongside these industrial policies? Absolutely. And this is where his thinking gets really nuanced. He brings up the idea of place-based programs, recognizing that it's not just about creating jobs, it's about creating communities where people feel connected and supported. This is where that earlier concept of social capital comes back into play, right? Building those strong families, those vibrant communities that he sees as crucial for upward mobility. Yes, Brooks argues that we need to weave together economic policy, family policy, community revitalization. It's all interconnected. He's calling for a much more holistic approach, recognizing that people need more than just a paycheck to thrive. This resonates so much with what we've been seeing in those communities hit hard by the decline of manufacturing. It's not just about bringing back jobs, it's about rebuilding a sense of hope and opportunity. And Brooks doesn't shy away from the big question looming over all of this China. He dedicates his third principle to tackling this challenge head on. He argues that the most effective way to counter China's growing influence is not through aggression, but by strategically pushing them to evolve. What does that look like in practice? How do we push a global superpower like China? Brooks suggests as a multi-pronged approach. Firstly, democratic nations need to present a united front. Denying China access to key technologies while simultaneously highlighting their human rights abuses sends a powerful message. By exposing the weaknesses of their current model, which he believes is becoming increasingly unsustainable, we can encourage them to adopt more responsible and sustainable economic policies. It's a high-stakes strategy for sure, but one that recognizes the interconnectedness of the global economy and the power of collective action. It's not about containment or conflict, but about nudging them towards a more cooperative and responsible role on the world stage. Right. And that brings us to Brooks's fourth principle, one that might seem a bit counterintuitive at first glance, support progressive deregulation. Wait a minute, I thought we were talking about a more active role for government in the economy. How does deregulation fit into that? That's the beauty of Brooks' argument. He's not advocating for blind faith in either big government or a completely hands-off approach. He's calling for smart governance. He recognizes that excessive regulation can stifle innovation and entrepreneurship, those very qualities that make the U.S. economy dynamic. So it's about finding that sweet spot, right? Providing targeted support and investment where it's needed, but also getting out of the way and letting American ingenuity flourish. Exactly. He argues that the U.S. has a history of fostering innovation and risk-taking, and he wants to see more of that even as we implement these new industrial policies. It's about recognizing that government has a role to play, but it's not about more government or less government. It's about smarter governance, mm -hmm. more strategic governance. Precisely. Yeah. And that leads us to his fifth and final principle, which really ties everything together. Unleash American dynamism. Brooks argues that the U.S. has this incredible capacity for innovation, resilience, and reinvention. We've faced down challenges before, and he believes we can do it again. But it requires a shift in mindset, right? A recognition that we're in a new era with new challenges, and we need to be bold and innovative in our approach. Exactly. He calls for a renewed focus on our strengths, like our entrepreneurial spirit, our world-class research institutions, and our culture of risk-taking. He argues that by tapping into these strengths, we can not only revitalize our economy, but also reclaim our place as a global leader. It's a powerful vision for the future, one that recognizes the scale of the challenges we face, but also the immense potential we have as a nation. And that, I think, is Brooks's ultimate message. He reminds us that the future is not predetermined. It's something we build day by day, choice by choice. And by embracing this new era of industrial policy with all its complexities and challenges, we can create a more just prosperous and ultimately a more hopeful future for all Americans. It's a call to action, not just for policymakers, but for all of us. To think differently, to work together, and to build that better future, he envisions. So as always, we want to hear from you. What resonated with you from this deep dive? What are your hopes and concerns about the future of work opportunity 
and the role of government in America. Join the conversation, share your thoughts, and let's keep exploring these critical issues together. Thanks for joining us for another deep dive. Until next time, keep learning, keep questioning, and keep striving for that better future.